from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, trade talks heat up between leaders of the world's largest economies. The Senate releases its version of a new farm bill and agribusiness prepping for the weather week ahead. Machinery Pete reports on equipment from foreign soil and researching ways to save irrigation water in Louisiana. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clint Griffiths. As we start a new week, we pick up where we left off Friday with unfinished trade business and tariffs that threatened to further push several key allies into a deep trade dispute. President Trump made a brief appearance at the G7 summit in Canada, where recently announced metal tariffs took center stage. Then the president lobbed another contentious issue into the fray, telling his counterparts that Russia should be allowed back into this economic bloc and return it to G8 status. The situations and the positions are very clear. The president of the U.S. thinks that uh, the U.S. have been treated in an unfair way by Europe and by others, and the others do think that this is not uh, the case. And Russia was kicked out of the group back in 2014 after the country annexed Crimea. Meanwhile, President Trump on a tweet storm ahead of the meeting, quote, please tell Prime Minister Trudeau and President Macron that they are charging the U.S. massive tariffs and create non-monetary barriers. The EU trade surplus with the U.S. is $151 billion, and Canada keeps our farmers and others out. Turning then to Canada, quote again, Canada charges the U.S. a 270% tariff on dairy products. They didn't tell you that, did they? Not fair to our farmers. Now, Dairy Farmers of Canada President Pierre Lampron pressed Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau to support Canadian dairy farmers, quote, We may disagree with President Trump's demands on access to the Canadian dairy market, but we recognize he is advocating for his dairy industry. As Canadian dairy farmers, we expect no less support from Prime Minister Trudeau. Now, last week, several major news outlets reporting that during recent trade talks in Beijing, China, proposed to buy roughly $70 billion worth of U.S. ag and energy products if the United States lifts its proposed tariffs. However, some in the administration say that number is flawed. I have no idea where that number came from. That is, that is not a number that has any relationship to any conversation that I've had. And, and I was the one, along with uh, my counterpart, Under Secretary McKinney uh, at USDA, that were having these conversations. I don't, I don't think those numbers are anywhere near... Uh, right. Is there any type of, of I, I this think, list that I, we're talking about that if we lift tariffs they would buy more ag goods? Is there a number in a list? I, I think there's have been a conversation ab about that but it's you know that 70 billion dollar number is even beyond an overall you know number. Dowd says there are structural sanitary and phytosanitary policy issues that need to be addressed before the U.S. can export significantly higher amounts of ag products into China. Meanwhile, Mexico's retaliatory tariffs on U.S. pork may not hit quite as hard and as fast as expected. Reuters confirming with Mexican officials that U.S. producers can sell pork legs and shoulders to Mexico via an import quota. Mexico set a quota of 350,000 tons that can be imported without tariffs. And the Mexican Economy Ministry making it clear the U.S. will be able to take advantage of those quotas. They do not exclude the U.S. Over the past decade, the U.S. has shipped nearly 90 percent of Mexico's imports. Retaliatory tariffs haven't slowed pork exports just yet. The latest numbers from the U.S. Meat Export Federation setting fresh records. This comes from April, the same month China placed a 25 percent tariff on U.S. pork in retaliation for U.S. steel and aluminum tariffs. USMEF says the U.S. exported $584 million worth of pork in April. That's a 13% increase over April of 2017. Through the first four months, the U.S. shipped $2.3 billion worth of pork, 4% above the record held during the same period last year. Representatives of beer giants Molson Coors, which owns the Miller brand, say newly imposed tariffs on aluminum imports will cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars and may force it to change its packaging. Miller Coors produces about 13 billion cans of beer and buys about a half billion pounds of aluminum annually. Officials say the tariff amounts to a tax increase on the company. We buy um, almost half a billion pounds of, of aluminum per year. Um, that's the equivalent of over 4,747 uh, jumbo jets. So that's a lot of aluminum. 
The brewer says 60 to 65 percent of all the beer that it packages goes into aluminum cans. The company says it may need to reconsider some of its packaging if that tariff continues. Solving our issues with key trading partners like Mexico is top of mind for the ag industry. After months of NAFTA renegotiations, the administration may be leaning toward individual bilateral deals. Betsy Jibben joins us now with more. Clinton Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue is pretty vocal. The administration has interest to potentially tear apart the NAFTA agreement and turn it into bilateral separate agreements. Is the U.S. ruling out a trilateral deal? Are we for sure aiming for two bilateral agreements, one with Canada and one with Mexico. You have to understand when we're doing this, it's when we're negotiating, very seldom are all, if ever, are all three countries in the room at the same time. These are bilateral conversations. We, we talk with Canada, we talk with Mexico. So is that fair for me to say they're aiming towards bilateral? Well, the, the answer is, is I don't know that it's ever really been any different than that anyway. While Dowd and others in the administration say the president is seeking bilateral agreements, there are reports U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer is pushing forward on NAFTA 2.0, looking to get back to the table following Mexico's elections. Now, the National Park Producers Council says without knowing any of the verbiage or what an agreement may look like, they say they will accept any agreement that restores trade with Mexico. We're for whatever works to restore our trade to Mexico and to keep that trade. So we've had zero tariffs in Mexico for quite some time, thanks to the NAFTA. It's a huge market for us. We're for the fastest possible solution for these trade disputes. Speaking of bilateral trade deals, the National Pork Producers Council say they continue to have a priority to get a bilateral trade deal with Japan. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Jibben. The Senate Ag Committee rolling out a draft of its version of the Farm Bill midday Friday. It includes several key provisions different from the House version. For instance, the Senate bill does not include work requirements for food stamp recipients. The Senate version increases the allowable CRP acreage to 25 million. The House version calls for 29 million. And the Senate bill tightens farm program eligibility by reducing the adjusted gross income limit from 900,000 to 700,000. After a contentious process, the Senate version of the farm bill may get support from members of the House. At the end of the day, will the White House support a farm bill that does not include work requirements for SNAP? We, we don't want to talk about the hypotheticals yet of what we will or won't sign. The reality is we expect the House to pass a farm bill with work requirements this summer. We expect the Senate bill to pass this summer. Probably sometime in the fall will be what's called a conference report when the two try to reconcile the two bills. So the president is very eager to sign a farm bill. He wants to deliver on that for farmers across America. The Senate's Farm Bill also includes language to create a national vaccine bank that would be tapped if there's an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. Livestock groups like the National Pork Producers Council have been pressing lawmakers on this issue. They say an outbreak of FMD in this country could devastate the industry by destroying markets. According to MPPC, the U.S. does not have access to enough FMD vaccine to handle more than a small localized outbreak. Mike Hoffman kicking off this week with a look across farm country and he has today's crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton, and thanks for the photo, by the way. Clinton took this picture in his backyard as planters were rolling late last week in northern Indiana. From snow and cold to frequent rains, it's been a stop and start kind of year in that part of the country. Last week, USDA says 98% of the state's corn is planted, 94% of soybeans, both well ahead of the five-year average. And taking a look at the uh, drought monitor, you can see it is still uh, very dry in the Four Corner region and still spots of extreme exceptional drought in the parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. We'll have your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. When we come back, a dynamic duo getting your week ready with a focus on weather at the Agribusiness Desk. And later, these Louisiana researchers are finding ways to better utilize irrigation water. That story today on In the Country. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing. Farmer first with a plan for every market. 
I got scar tissue there. Same thing with any dent or dings on this truck. They all got a story about what happened to them. It was raining. There was only one way out. I could feel the barbed bar wire just digging into the paint. Two bulls were fighting. Bam, hit the truck. Try explaining that to your insurance company. Another ding, another scratch. It would just be another chapter in the story. Every scar tells a story, and you can tell a lot more stories when your truck is a Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest-lasting, full-size pickups on the road. Join Farm Journal agronomists this summer for the Farm Journal Yield Tour. Led by industry experts Ken Ferry and Missy Bauer, topics include assessing technology for maximum return and mastering variable rate and multi-hybrid planting. There will also be a live AgriTalk taping with host Chip Flory. Visit agweb.com forward slash farm journal yield tour to find a stop near you. Sponsored by Valent, Trimble, and Agrigold. Here at the Agribusiness Desk today, we have Brian Split with Allendale, Tommy Grusoff with Advanced Trading. All right, as we look at last week and we look ahead to the week uh, that's you know here already, what are you watching? What's, what are you expecting? There's been a big sales pitch or something about how it's going to be hot this summer. And typically summers are hot and That's winters true. are cold and we have snow. And uh, is it possible that the last few summers, the last four years have been abnormally cooler? Now I see where, you know, always someone could throw out a record high temperature, but we're having record crops. So I'm not so sure that this weather is so extreme that I don't see the 2012, uh, you know, scenario right now. Uh, we're, we have all types of rain in the forecast. So yeah, summers are hot. Is it hot with rain behind it? Or is it hot in, in most drought markets, there's always rain in the forecast. Yeah. And then it doesn't rain and that's how the drought happens. Okay, what about you, Brian? What are you watching? Weather, is that the you your know, key right now? To Tommy's point um, with weather, I think something that the trade in general is gonna be watching is the big deviation we're having between the GFS model and the European model. And so uh, the GFS is definitely much wetter and the European mm -hmm. model is, is warm and it's got a, a deficit of precip. And so in the next week here, I'd like to see which one is more accurate. And I think as we move forward through the growing season, the trade is going to pick a winner mm -hmm. and then go with that forecast model moving forward. So uh, that's what I'm gonna be watching closely is which one turns out to be right. And I'm gonna be using that to make decisions moving right. forward. Tommy, last week we had uh, a couple rough days for, for a couple crops, soybeans, a uh, pretty rough day. Uh, any indicators there for what to expect going forward? Well, we knew coming in the year with the price action we, we had and the problems in South America, that's going to be a volatile year. We also have an administration that throws out tweets and, uh, and socially we're just a different, the way we receive information is different. So uh, this, this is good, volatility is good. There's certain people who deal with it better than others. And uh, I, I always tell our producers, just you're in the bushel business. You're not in the weather predicting business. You're not in the political business. A farmer who knew their APH and had a plan and is much happier who has discipline than someone who's sitting there living by each and every weather forecast. It's no way to go through life, in my opinion. All right, thank you both for being here. We'll be back with more Agri, just a minute. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. To talk to Brian Split one-on-one, -on -one, call Allendale Incorporated at 800-551-4626 or email him at bsplit at allendale-inc.com. No matter what you do, you're always raising the bar. New Delaro fungicide for corn and soybeans can help you get the edge you're looking for. Delaro has a broader spectrum of disease control and best-in-class dual mode of action residual. Plus, it improves plant health, so your top-performing hybrids and varieties will have the protection they need to help you achieve your personal best yields. Delaro fungicide from Bayer. Keep raising the bar. 22 years ago, I was a man with an idea to help the American farmer do a better job of marketing their grain and livestock. Today, Top Third has grown from one man with an idea to an experienced team, specially trained to bring our focus mission to you. Experience the Top Third mission for yourself. Come see us at an event near you or call us at 877-TT-HEDGE.
Welcome back to Ag Day, meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, as we look at the uh, jet stream here, everyone's talking about the ridge and, and will it hold? It, it keeps getting cut down by these troughs coming from west to east across the country. And as long as that pattern holds, which I think it will, we won't be, see a, be seeing a prolonged drought or a long period of hot weather. Now, obviously, the southern plains, that may not be true. You'll notice the troughs kind of stay in the northern half of the country. That keeps a lot of the Corn Belt from uh, turning into a hot, dry condition uh, situation. You can see as we head through Wednesday, the trough flattens down the ridge in the northern plains. Still kind of holds in the southern plains, but that's typical as you head through summer. And then that trough kind of reforms into the northeast. Another one comes into the northwest as we head uh, toward the end of the week with the ridge building back up into the middle of the country. And more than likely, that process uh, will continue. You can see it kind of gets uh, cut down again across the northern plains by early the following week. So uh, that trend has been there for a couple of weeks, and I, I see it continuing at this point. So temperatures this week, we are going above normal for the uh, Tennessee and Ohio River Valleys. Most of the plain states, except the far northern areas that occasionally gets those cold fronts, and all of the west expected to be above normal, below or uh, near normal, I should say, in the southeast, generally because uh, the ground is pretty wet in a lot of those areas from the rains you've had so far this season, and below normal for the northern Great Lakes into most of New England. Precipitation this coming week, then, we're going below normal for northern New England, the far northern Great Lakes, much of central and eastern Canada, and then from Iowa, Missouri, through uh, the southern uh, Mississippi Valley and the rest of the southeast mid-Atlantic, including the Ohio and Tennessee see valleys above normal precipitation this week. Unfortunately, those drought areas of uh, central western Texas, western Oklahoma into southwestern Kansas, I'm going below normal there, above or near normal in the uh, the Four Corner region because you'll have those typical afternoon variety thunderstorms and above normal in the Pacific Northwest. 30 day outlook for temperatures. Kind of the same looking map, a little bit anyway. Uh, northern eastern Great Lakes into New England, below normal temperatures. Southern Mississippi Valley, most of the plains and most of the west expected to be above normal. Precipitation over the next 30 days, the southeast mid-Atlantic through the Great Lakes into uh, Minnesota. Northern uh, or eastern portions of North Dakota, above normal. And then below normal from Texas on up into the northern portions of the Rockies. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to San Luis Obispo, first of all, in California, mostly sunny, breezy, and warm, high of 82. Aberdeen, South Dakota, variably cloudy, chance of a storm, high 78. And Chattanooga, Tennessee, warm and humid, a thunderstorm possible, high of 88. Up um, next, Machinery Pete takes a global view of the classics. He shares his insights from Ireland this week. And later, irrigation can help preserve yields through those hot and dry stretches of summer. We'll look at researchers' efforts to make sure wells don't run dry in Louisiana. Great townhouse, great neighborhood. Pizza, Pilates, public transit. It's all right here and so walkable. Aww. Somebody wants to say hi. With neighborhood insights straight from the locals, Trulia helps you discover a place you'll love to live. Looking for a safer way to burn yard waste? Stop, don't burn in a rusty barrel like this. Burn the safe way with the burn cage. It doesn't just burn, it incinerates, leaving nothing behind but fine ash. And when you're done, the burn cage folds up neatly for storage. For a free information kit about the burn cage, call 1-800-731-8736. That's 1-800-731-8736. Online at burncage.com. Great townhouse, great neighborhood, pizza, Pilates, public transit. It's all right here and so walkable. Aww. Somebody wants to say hi. With neighborhood insights straight from the locals, Trulia helps you discover a place you'll love to live. Machinery Pete doesn't just travel the states. This week, he's checking out equipment across the pond. Greg? Hey, folks, Machinery Pete here on the road uh, quite a ways away this week. I'm actually over in Ireland, been on vacation here, first time ever visiting, and uh, I gotta say the people are as nice as I've heard for years, had a great time over here, but, but you know me, everywhere I go, my eye is out for tractors. Now on the topic of blue tractors, last month on a collector auction across the sea in England, it was May 12th, the Paul uh, Cable Collector Auction, amazing line of Ford tractors. You can see here the lineup, just outstanding. And there were four tractors that really caught my eye on this sale. And here's a picture of the first one, folks. Uh, just outstanding 1975 Ford 7000. 
I mean, have you ever seen one that sharp? And this thing sold for just, just under 28,000 pounds, which when you do the conversion, comes to $37,689 US. Uh, so that was one record price. Another one was on this Ford FW60. Again, just immaculate. Uh, and when you did the conversion here, it came out to $41,955 US. And next up was this Ford TW30. And this baby went for $35,555 US. But I guess the tractor they were really talking about in this sale was this one, a 1985 Ford County 1474 long nose. And I gotta say, first one I've ever run across. So for 94,500 pounds, and you do the math, comes out to $128,000 US. Next, we'll look at irrigation research in Louisiana as farmers. If you're a man, then you can't afford to miss this announcement. Because as we get older, we may have to deal with the signs of an aging prostate. And that can mean urinating more often, waking up at night for bathroom trips, dribbling or sudden urges, or issues with intimacy. When you call the number on your screen, you'll get a free bottle of Super Beta Prostate, America's number one formula for prostate support. For you, this means less urges to urinate, more sleep with less interruptions, easier bladder emptying, and a healthy urine flow. Don't ignore your prostate health. You can reduce your time in the bathroom, regain control, and improve the quality of your life by trying your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Call right now to get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Call 1-800-443-4280 or visit superbetap3.com. Call 1-800-443-4280. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Learn more about Kubota SSV Series skid steers at Kubota.com or demo one at your local Kubota dealer today. A hot and dry May has caused many farmers in Louisiana to begin irrigating their crops. Researchers with the LSU Ag Center are looking at ways to minimize water usage and lessen the drawdowns on area aquifers. LSU Ag Center's Craig Gotro has details. Irrigation devices running are a common sight in cropland across much of Louisiana. May has been unusually hot and dry, leading farmers to begin irrigating their crops earlier this growing season. Stacia Davis-Conger, an irrigation specialist with the LSU Ag Center, says soil types will affect how you irrigate. Sand doesn't hold as much water uh, because the particles are bigger, which means the pore spaces are bigger and water runs through it. A clay, you're going to want to irrigate probably more frequently, but less amount. There are two primary irrigation methods used in Louisiana. One is a pivot device that slowly moves through the field while irrigating. The second method involves plastic pipes that flow water down the rows. Punching the correct size hole in the pipe is crucial to proper irrigation. If you're punching too big of a hole, then more water is going to come out than it should. You can have uh, water run out the bottom of the field before it should. That's a big issue with having the wrong hole size. Soil type will also influence where and how many holes are punched. The northeast side of the state where we have the sharky clay soils, some of those producers punch a hole every fourth row because there's so much clay that the water moves laterally and gets to the other rows. In a dry year, it can take more than a foot of irrigation water to produce a crop. You're probably going to apply between two to three inches of water every time you irrigate. Then you add that up for each irrigation event. If you're doing five irrigation events, that's probably about 15 inches of water. Davis Conger is studying the use of sensors in fields to determine when producers should irrigate and hopes the sensors will reduce water usage and waste. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. Thanks, Craig, and that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Start your week with us. For Mike Hoffman and all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.